The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening from wherever you may be joining us. Thanks for attending today's Teller Test Studio webinar. This will be our Test Studio R3 release webinar for 2019, our last major release of 2019. And actually, uh, as I speak, we just dropped a service pack uh, for this as well. So we've got some new features that are really hot, just came out uh, as we speak. So we'll talk about some of those. Today's agenda, or actually first today's speakers, myself, I'm Andy Wheeland, I'm sales engineer for Test Studio, and I've been working with this product for about seven and a half years. Uh, also a certified scrum master and do a lot of agile testing, coaching, and so forth. Also, we'll be hearing from Peter Gorgorev, uh, sales engineer, CSM, PSM, Prince2. He's got all the credentials uh, and, and plenty of information to share as well. And he'll be uh, speaking up for us on a couple of those topics. And then also we may hear from Ilyan Penchev, our product manager for Test Studio, uh, along the way. A couple webinar housekeeping items here. All of the callers are muted throughout the call, so you can be as loud as you, you want to. Um, we are recording this session, and we will make that available as well. And we're going to have um, the questions panel open, of course, anything you need along the way, technical issues that you're having with GoToWebinar or questions about products or what you're seeing, feel free to ask. We'll have people answering those questions throughout. And then we'll also have some poll questions that we'll insert along the way. We ask, please participate in those poll questions. They really help us understand uh, the customers a little bit better and, and get some information uh, for you that we can help you with. So today's agenda, we're going to start with the brand new Test Studio Executive Dashboard. Uh, we'll look at test lists that have been added into the Test Studio Dev Edition. Then we'll talk about Find Logic and or Image Search, a new capability that's been enhanced. And of course, the brand new translators for Blazor, Chromium Edge support, and uh, also, we'll be going into some of the Test Studio technique, kind of showing you uh, how a, a user may take some of the best practices that we use in training our customers and put them into place in their testing creation and maintenance as well. So without further ado, I'm going to hand the mic over to Peter, and he'll be introducing you guys to the executive dashboard. Thank you very much, Andy. And uh, let me guys share my screen all right so good morning or good evening or afternoon for me as well my name is peter i'm going to present to you currently the exec executive dashboard one of the latest features that were added to the studio r3 2019 release a few words before we start, and actually about the executive dashboard itself, uh, it's a web-based results server, right? It, uh, it displays all the results from the Test Studio project and gives you visibility because everybody needs visibility. You know, with the executive dashboard, we are presenting, introducing another persona currently, which is the manager, right? We want to show you guys, we want to show the managers as smooth as possible the overall health uh, of the project and how the testing goes, of course. So you can access the executive dashboard online, as you can, as you can see how I'm doing it currently. And the most important thing is that you don't need a test studio license to do that. Right. Once you have the studio, you can distribute the executive dashboard, the web-based results server, actually. You can distribute it to whoever of your stakeholders you wish. Right. Now about uh, the dashboard itself and its features, first and foremost, we have the refresh interval. Like we're doing in our office ourselves, uh, we are firing the dashboard on big TV screens. And from the settings, you can make the dashboard automatically refresh from every one minute to every one hour, if you want. All of your scheduled projects from the studio will appear on the dashboard projects drop-down list, right? 
And let me pull one interesting project like this one, for example. What the dashboard itself show you is first the test lists, which I can, of course, dynamically search for in the search bar. Imagine you have much more test lists in real in real case listed here of course uh, and uh, it shows the status of the last run of this test list after it is scheduled uh, the start time of the last run of this test list and the summary of the last 10 runs as you can see here i have five failed and five successful runs of this test list and my pass rate is uh, 50 percent Another cool and useful feature so far will be the is the add to favorites one. It means that if you have more than three test lists listed here, you can quickly access them and bookmark them, let's say like that, by clicking on the favorites icon. Let's see one test list in such case. Once I click it, I have all the runs here as you can see with the start time which i can sort with end time which i can also sort with the tests if the tests were rerun or not the server and the machine they were executed and the status of the corresponding run you have pagination and the ability to display from five to 50 results uh, in this grid. If I want to go back, you can use our breadcrumb navigation here. So you can go back into the previous page, right? All right, let me choose one run. And this one, for example, where you can see the test, the browser it was executed on, Again, the start and end time, if it was rerun, and the status. You have the other, the same navigation options, of course, here on the grid, or you can go back with, uh, with the breadcrumb navigation. And you have two options now. I can see the test itself by clicking on this expand button. It's a very basic test, of course. It's a, it's a demonstration test, and I can see the walk of the test itself here. This is the same information which you get at in Test Studio itself. Right, the failure information, the walk, which you can copy to the clip uh, to the clipboard and then paste it uh, and move forward. So this is how basically the executive dashboard works. Just a few technical information. Here you can configure it from Test Studio. It gets uh, by default uh, it switched off, so you need to configure it in addition. And it also feeds information from the scheduling and storage servers. So have this in mind. Everything is of course explained within our documentation. So whoever is uh, online documentation, so whoever is interested can uh, look for it uh, there. A few a few words about what's coming. Of course, we're going to invest time and effort into this, into this uh, dashboard. Uh, with our next releases, with the beginning of the next year, we are going to introduce some more sophisticated reporting. You know, with all the fancy charts that will give you more, a better representation of the entire project status. And of course, everything that managers and uh, the related stakeholders love. All right, so stay tuned for what's coming into the executive dashboard in 2020. Right, I see that you already have some questions which are, my colleagues are answering. I guess they're about the dashboard, but let's move on for the sake of time with the webinar itself. Andy, I'm going to switch back to you with the demonstration. Just give me a second and there we go. Perfect. Thank you, Peter. Welcome. So the, the next new feature that we'll be talking about <clears throat> really represents something that we're that's close to our heart, which is to really get 
information and get feedback, have a feedback loop with our customers. And that comes in the form of our feedback portal. Uh, and based on a lot of the suggestions and the votes that people were providing, there was a need that we felt uh, within the Test Studio Dev Edition. So those of you, if you're not familiar, Test Studio provides you a standalone IDE, uh, which has a built-in, uh, which, which also provides you access to this Visual Studio plugin. But as part of our DevCraft Ultimate bundle for our DevCraft users, you also have the uh, Test Studio Dev Edition as well, the Visual Studio plugin version. And one of the features that uh, we decided to add based on customer feedback was adding test lists into Visual Studio plugin. Um, so now you can create and maintain those test lists there. You can organize them. You can execute them from you know, within Visual Studio as well as from within a CI CD process. And I'm going to pass it back to Peter to show you what that looks like. Thank you very much, Andy. Here is my Visual Studio that you can see on your screens. Uh, for the ones uh, who were with us uh, on the previous webinars, you know that my favorite persona is uh, the developer one. I really don't. I really don't want to switch environments. I really don't want to switch context. So I want to be able to do anything from my favorite ID. In the case uh, with uh, with Visual Studio, right? You know that Test Studio exists as a Visual Studio plugin, and really one of the most requested and wanted features was the ability to be able to create and modify test lists from Visual Studio itself with the help of Test Studio plugin. Right, this is the same functionality that exists in the standalone version of Test Studio, meaning that you can create both static or dynamic test lists, you know, dynamic test lists which execute separate tests based on some um, common properties, right? So how it works, I'm going to quickly show you, of course. When you open a Test Studio project, you have this folder which is called Test Lists. You can see it here and within it, you can add a new test list, which I'm going to do right away. As I mentioned, it could be a static test list or a dynamic one. For the sake of this presentation, I'm going to add a once it's added, you can again access it from, from this specific folder. When I open it, I can select the tests that I want to add within this test list. And uh, what we can do now, navigate to Telerik and look for executive dashboard. Let's say all the properties of the test list in question can be modified from here. For the ones of you who are already using Test Studio, I guess that you're going to be pretty much familiar with the test list properties. You can have general ones or separate, whether it's a web test or desktop WPF test. Right, so once everything is saved, in the test list, you need to build your project one more time. And after the project is successfully built, let me just wait. Yep, build succeeded. Within the test, within the Visual Studio, sorry, Test Explorer, the test lists will appear here, as you can see. And here is my guy which is called webinar one, webinar two, and I can execute uh, on the fly uh, if I want. What's the good part? Remember that we were discussing that uh, we'd like to position Test Studio not only as a UI automation tool, but also as a collaboration tool between the different stakeholders. What you can do now is that you can share those test lists between your developers and QAs, if you want, with the help of the source code, uh, source code integration. Whether it's going to be TFS, DevOps, 
or uh, or Git. Now it's even easier to modify, share, and reuse those test lists. And uh, talking about TFS and Azure, I would like to just quickly mention that once you have those test lists living within your uh, source control, you can attach them to a build and trigger the test list with uh, the corresponding build or uh, release. On my screens, you can see my testing Azure DevOps environment. Of course, where uh, in advance I have created a self-hosted agent, which was attached to a pipeline, right? And whenever I queue and I run this pipeline, as you can see here, the results, I've been running uh, all day for the sake of the demonstration. The corresponding test list can be attached. It's just a simple task which triggers our command line script, and then you can add another task in order to publish the results from this test list. Right? Easy as it is. We also have full blown demo of that, we have full documentation how to configure. It, so whoever is interested can take advantage of uh, this cool feature, right? And with this set, I'm going to pass the show again to my colleague Andy, so we can move forward with the webinar. Great, thanks, Peter. Welcome. All right, so we're going to move on into. Uh, another new feature that came to us in R2, which has now been enhanced further with this R3 release as well, which is the not only the fine logic that Test Studio has been known for for a long time, uh, the flexibility, as you can see in the screenshot here, of locating elements by attributes that uh, are consistent cross browser, they're uh, stable, you know, you can really identify and customize your test project to fit the application. And now we've added the ability to use image search as well, or in addition, in addition to, it could basically act as a backup search. So if Test Studio fails to find the element by the prescribed find logic, it could then kick in as a backup search and look for the image based off the image match, the pixel match. Um, or as of this uh, uh, latest release, you have the ability to make a choice. You can choose at a project level if you'd like to have image first search or at a step level or at a test list level as well. So for those applications that are maybe more heavily image driven or for tricky automation scenarios where image might work better than fine logic, you now have the choice to choose or use both, right? Use that backup capability if you'd like to um, or go for the uh, the fine logic. So um, really makes your, your tests a lot stronger, a lot more robust over time. And I'm gonna jump over here to Test Studio to show you what that looks like. Just to uh, come into this project for a moment, here you can see a couple of the things that, that come with this. So first of all, there's a really nice cosmetic effect that comes with this feature, which is the fact that over here in my element repository, I can float over an element and see its corresponding image, right? So very cool uh, added feature that uh, really helps you connect the, the test step itself to the image. And then of course, again, too, you can see this down below. So when we look at uh, step seven here, the add to cart button, you see it gives me that image down below as well. So great cosmetic kind of effect that came from this new feature that people are really raving about. Uh, in addition though, you can click on this image and go directly into the image uh, properties itself for that element. Now keep in mind, this element may be used in many different tests. So I can make choices as to how I wanna identify that and manipulate that uh, that logic. Uh, so here we can do things like add the image or apply them to specific test or step. Uh, we can update the image if we need to, upload it from a file or select, select it from a browser. There's even some run to options. So if I wanted to go into the test and get to that particular step, I can use run to step to get there. Uh, and of course a threshold uh, as well that you can set for that so that you can adjust for you know minute differences in the way things may be rendered. And then if I click on this image search button up at the top, 
we're back to the classical uh, find logic search. And of course, you have a launch recorder here option as well. And once I do that, we'll see the live DOM, we'll see some suggestions come back and all those kinds of things as well. Um, so this new image search functionality is really powerful. It really enhances an already powerful framework, giving you more options. And uh, I'll show you where those options exist here in a moment. But again, now we're in the live kind of editing of an element mode. Uh, we're getting suggestions back from the live environment, which I have over here on my other screen. We have the recorder connected and, and everything. So just by clicking that button, it gets you right to where you need to be and allows you to then work from the DOM, work from the suggestions, flip over to the image pro properties and, and work with those. So you've got a lot of uh, capabilities here that we've, that we've added in. All right, so I'm gonna close this down uh, just to come back here and show you that inside of the test step itself, you have the search by image first option here. Right now I have it set to parent setting. So that means it's gonna come either from the project setting or the test list setting. Whatever that project or that test list setting has will override the, the local step setting with this parent uh, option turned on. And then you can also, at a step level here, choose to use image first by marking this true or uh, disable that capability by using false. So this really gives you flexibility at the step level. You'll see the property also sits in our properties panel here. And at the project level here, if we go over to project settings, you see there's a whole element images section. So whether we're gonna be capturing the images, the default threshold we're gonna use, uh, the image search on execution, a, a timeout that's used for this as well. Also the ability to scroll, you'll see that when it does kick into image search with this turned on, it will scroll through the page until it can find that particular image. Uh, so it's a really useful feature as well. And of course, if you need to, you can clear your images out. We still have the classic find logic here as well, where you can add and customize and reorder things to fit your application under test. So some great enhancements that we've added, not only having the backup fake, uh, capability, but also the uh, ability to you know, use it first. And here in the find logic, you can even see the project level search by image first option here. So uh, really great enhancements and advancements that we're making with the framework level capabilities of, of Test Studio. All right, so jumping back over to the slides here for a moment. Next up, we're gonna take a look at cutting edge technologies or at least talk about them. Um, we have some great teller controls out there. Many people may know of us from uh, Kendo and, and those kinds of things. Blazor is really uh, the best cutting edge capability that's out there, right? right? It's the return of, of C sharp to to web dev and you know coming kind of away maybe from from the JavaScript controls. Um, of course, we have support for JavaScript. You can work with JavaScript. There's Kendo Angular. There's Kendo jQuery. There's you know any really third party or custom JavaScript controls and components you can work with, and of course with Blazor as well. And similarly to how we do with uh, other translators, we have our own set for our own controls. These give you some added advantages. So as you're building your brand new apps in Blazor, just keep in mind Test Studio is here for you. Uh, really for all of our, our products, all of our control sets, there's no better testing solution on the market. It's because of these translators, it gives you an a, a edge up, it gives you a leg up to be able to recognize and work with very complex controls like, but like dynamic grids, uh, drop downs, all sorts of different capabilities that we build in and some bonus features as well. You'll find that when you're working with Teller controls, and the element highlighter, you'll see that there's some advantages, some, some additional verification options that are uh, available to you as well. And then also to announce uh, with today's drop of the service pack, we are including the Edge Chromium browser support. So uh, we wanted to make sure we were ahead of schedule uh, and, and hit zero day uh, compatibility and support for Chromium Edge. Uh, this is our beta version of it, of course, because it's still in beta uh, commercially. And once that goes live, we'll be right on step with that. But as of today, you can download the new update and you can try that out, um, both recording and executing in Chromium as well. So a great new addition. This just really both of these show you that we're constantly looking at what's upcoming, what's the cutting edge, where do we need to be, and how do we keep our, our customers on that edge as well, pun intended. 
So moving on. Next up, uh, oh, and I apologize. I um, I I'd forgotten to mention that we did have some poll questions. So let me let me make a pause here for a moment before we go into this next section, and we'll present you with their first poll question. So as this comes up, please uh, please participate, provide any kind of answers that make sense for you, and uh, it will give you a moment to respond, and then we'll continue from there. All right, keep them coming. Get your final answers in here. We're going to close the poll here in just a few moments. So, Okay, perfect. So moving on, um, I'm going to talk about the Test Studio technique. So we work with a lot of customers uh, who've been with us for years, and still sometimes there's some surprises. There's features or there's techniques that maybe they didn't see or, or learn on their own. Um, so we really wanted to take you through, you know, how we would add best practices into uh, test creation and some of the test maintenance kind of functionalities. And this way also exploring a lot of the features that people don't necessarily know are there sometimes. So the test studio technique really, first it starts with settings. You know, there's a lot of flexibility in Test Studio to configure the project to fit the application under test, as we've talked about with Fine Logic, with Image Search. Uh, there's also behavioral kind of settings around whether we're going to do real typing or um, you know other functionalities. And let me get to the next slide here, if my slide will advance. There we go. Um, so as you can see, here's a selection of some of those. We just looked at a few of these settings in Test Studio itself, as I mentioned, the fine logic, um, the recording of, of element images, and then of course the recording options itself, things like how do we compare the page level, um, you know, are we using real clicks or real typing? A lot of these can be set at test level and at step level, but the idea here is that when you can identify the appropriate settings, the most optimal settings for an application under test, you want to implement those at your at your project level so that when you hit record, all of these settings are, are defaulted to what works best for your application. That way you're not having to make changes at the step level. You actually can make these changes at the project level, hit record, and it will apply that. And keep in mind too that when you hit record is when the new settings are applied. If you change these settings, it's not going to change anything you've previously done in Test Studio. So it also gives you some opportunity to experiment a little bit try some different settings until you feel like you have a nice reliable test creation and long-term test maintenance process and then you can really stick with those so you know keep that in mind uh that's that's step number one if we jump over here to test studio we can see what some of those settings look like in person and as you can see there's uh, element highlighter settings this is more of kind of the cosmetic things if you are doing wpf testing this default application setting is really useful this is something that's typically configured at a, at a test level, uh, but here you can actually set it up at a project level. And that way, anytime you start a new WPF test, it will naturally uh, be naturally configured for your default application there. If you're working with the secure site HTTPS, registering the certificate can be done from here. Uh, if you're using a proxy as well and, um, and tracking the active file, that's a, a feature here that uh, works with our project explorer. Um, on the record settings, again, as I mentioned, you've got compare mode as far as how it's going to identify the URL uh, of the page that you're targeting. And then things like how are you going to interact or record the interaction for a drop down? And of course, are you going to simulate real clicks and real typing? And I'll tell you, if you have a JavaScript heavy application, you might be looking to turn these on at a project level. This is one that I do look at uh, at an application by application basis. They are defaulted off um, out of the box. So early on in your first few tests, you might find that you're turning this 
feature on at the step level a lot. And if that's the case, you probably may be better off turning on at the project level so that way you don't have to go back to all the different steps to do that. If it's just a one-off step here or there, you might just keep it at the test level setting. But uh, again, if you find that there's a trend, bring it up to the, the settings, the project level here so you can work with it from there. Uh, we talked about element images and those features there. On the browsers, of course, we are continually growing and, and keeping up to date with these browsers. So here you want to make sure that you're restoring your browsers and, and recalibrating those browsers as well. Uh, there's basic options here to restore and recalibrate. And you can also have this enabled at the execution time. There's a checkbox that allows you to have it uh, calibrate the browser prior to executing the test. You also find that in our test list settings as well. So keep your browsers uh, calibrated. And if you have any difficulties with a particular browser, this is one of the first places to go check. You know, it never hurts to, even if it says calibrated, just hit restore and recalibrate it just in case. All right. If you're working in code, you want to add your references, this is the place to do that. You'll see that there's a similar spot in the Visual Studio plugin to do the same. And that way you can leverage your usings and uh, all the different uh, references that you might be adding in for your test creation. The translators themselves, they are all on, defaulted on. They're all here. Uh, as I mentioned, not only the new Blazor, but Kendo Angular, Kendo jQuery, our, our RAD, the RAD controls from Ajax are in here. Of course, the base translators as well give you coverage for all of your custom and third-party uh, controls that are out there as well. And then if you're still working with Silverlight, don't worry, we still have you covered. Uh, your translators for Silverlight uh, testing are still here. And of course, our WPF uh, translators as well. So as things progress, we're still going to be updating and adding to these as new technologies come up, as new components come out. So stay tuned for more. And uh, these are great. They basically work for you. You don't necessarily have to think about them, but when Test Studio finds one of your uh, components to be Teller component, it will naturally kick in the translator. It will discover that it, it recognizes it and it will use the appropriate translator. So really nothing needed to be done, uh, except that knowing that they are here and that they're working for you. Okay. And of course, if you uh, want to, you can enable your data collection capability there for uh, for helping us out, understanding the best ways to use uh, Test Studio and uh, maybe where we need to go next with it as well. And I mentioned earlier too, the feedback portal being a loop, uh, a feedback loop to our team. As you can see up in the help menu, if you haven't used it or seen it before, you can go to submit feedback. You'll see things that people are requesting and voting on out there. And we really would love for everybody to contribute. Go vote for things, go make your own requests. Um, you know, help us help you because we really do use that in planning our mo our roadmap. Okay, so in this test studio technique, again, first things first is really to understand the settings and work with those settings. And this is also a point where if you're struggling or if you're not quite sure, feel free to reach out to us. We'd love to get you over this initial kind of uh, step that's required to make sure that you get the most out of test studio. So. Um, Keep in mind what those settings look like. And really it's a process I call analysis of the application. Those first few tests you're making are gonna tell you uh, if you maybe need to go change some settings or not, right? And again, if you need help with that, we can help you out. Please reach out to your, to your rep and we can always schedule a call or submit a support ticket and our support team is ready to help as well. So after we have settings, we have record. So you have the Test Studio recorder to capture the steps and the elements for you the powerful recorder that's basically kicking in that fine logic, or if you've enabled that image search or both, right? All that's just happening for you as you click around, we're gonna capture those elements and those steps for you. And then step three, and actually I should mention really two and three are almost com combined because as you're recording, it's best to be able to add verifications on the fly, right? And I'll show you this technique in practice here in a moment. But the ability to kind of build a test is not just hit record and go do what a user does, even though I've said that so many times before. It's really best served when you're consciously thinking about how a test should be built, not just the user workflow. And especially if you're coming from a manual testing environment, uh, verifications are something that you don't necessarily think about sometimes from a manual test. It's just innate. But for automation, you need to tell the test what to look for. You need to have it have assertions 
to make sure that what you expected to happen happened. And also it helps in many cases to make your test more robust, make your test more bulletproof as we like to call it. So you can add these verifications on the fly as you're building your test, strengthen your test. Here's an example, as you can see the Blazor uh, translators kicking in on this grid in the background and uh, the verifications and weights and all sorts of different options that are available to add to your test from there. So definitely, definitely, definitely add verifications. It, it makes my heart hurt a little bit every time I get on a customer call, uh, not every time, but there are times where I've gotten on customer calls and I see tests with no verifications in them. And uh, usually that's the solution is we add a few verifications and the test is working correctly again because we've put in those assertions or maybe adjusted timing to make sure that things are being waited for or verify that things are visible or enabled, all those kinds of functions that you have. And then I put in clean your test. So as we're going through the course of recording, inevitably we're gonna click things that we don't need. We're gonna kind of haphazardly do things like we may normally do as a, as a user and just kind of click back and forth and click around and stuff. You really wanna have a purpose and a workflow nailed down for your, your test. So as you're going through it, you know, keep track of editing while you're recording, clean your test, basically making sure that you don't get intent, unintended drag and drops, as you can see here, uh, I had a drag and drop. Unless you actually have an intended drag and drop step that you wanna create, you probably don't need drag and drops. They are commonly recorded sometimes when we simply move our mouse with our cursor down, or if we, uh, let's say, highlight text to clear out a field, that might capture a drag and drop step but likely we don't need a drag and drop step to uh, type our text in that field. So keep in mind that those sometimes may be extra, extra steps that are unneeded. And also key presses. Again, something that should be intentional, right? There's some products that I've worked with where we'll intentionally hit an enter key after an entry of something versus clicking a button. But primarily when we're doing automation, it's better to exercise the UI and click the button than it is to exercise the keyboard and click, you know, the have it exercise, have it click the button essentially. So exercise the UI first. Check your keyboard operations. Many tools out there use tabs to cheat to get from one element to the next. You don't need that in Test Studio. Our Element Find Logic does that. So you know you don't have to have those to to jump around from field to field. The logic is there to go find the element and then act against it. So keep in mind those are some things that you may be looking for that may be clogging up your test with extra steps or causing issues where really they're not needed. They may just be accidental uh, recordings of test steps there. And then adjust the timing. With your test, you wanna make sure the test is not outpacing the application. You wanna make sure that async calls have time to come back from the server. Uh, you wanna make sure that the things are, are you know, progressing the right way, that you've got time for a spinning dial to spin. Um, you know, There's a lot of things that you can do to adjust the timeouts, add verifications to help you with that, and basically make a very strong test that can stand up over time. And something that, a, a good clue that you may be having a timing issue is uh, if the test can pass and then fail, you know, if, it's, if it basically passes and fails, uh, you know, at different periods, that, that's more likely a timing issue. If it's something that's pass, 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 and then starts failing consistently, maybe that's something different. But if it's kind of a pass, fail, pass, fail, kind of mix of those, it's likely something related to timing. So uh, I'll show you how we can take a look at you know, adjusting that here in a moment. All right, um, before I jump over, I'm gonna, uh, again, allow for uh, a poll question here. So please feel free to take the next moment to fill out our next poll question. And then we're gonna go through and show you some of this test studio technique.
Okay, we're wrapping that poll up. Get your final answers in while you can. And thanks for your contributions to, to those questions as well. All right, great. Thanks, everybody. So we're going to continue now with showing you what this Test Studio technique actually looks like in practice. So here I am back in Test Studio where I have a Kendo Karat operation. Now, this really highlights a lot of functionality of Test Studio and really focuses, too, on keeping things low code or no code. Um, also, it takes advantage of one of our most popular features, test to step And, of course, we do have API test to step I'm not using it in this scenario. But the ability to modularize and reuse pieces of tests or subtests, if you will, to put together these types of scenarios. For example, in my Kendo CRUD operation, I have these separated into three subtests that are being called by a master test. Uh, this lets them run in sequence, and it allows me to work and maintain this test in these different segments uh, more easily without having to deal with a very long, exhaustive test. Now, in addition, because it's modularized like this, I could also do something like turn off the update uh, subtest and just run the create and delete. So there's a lot of flexibility that you gain when you use this kind of modular approach to your test creation. Now, within this test, uh, we're going to actually go through and, and recreate this test to show you some of the technique being built. But uh, in, in most tests, what you want to make sure you have is verifications early and often, especially when it's a critical uh, time period in the test or your expected results should be there. Uh, you want to make sure those verifications are there. Definitely at the, at the end of the test is a good spot for a ver verification too. For example, on a login test, I might have a verification at the end that says, did we get logged in uh, to make sure that we have that proof that that, that component uh, works correctly or that test functions correctly before we move on to something else. And as you'll see in my next subtest here, the update subtest, it actually starts with a verification. I actually have this uh, create in there right now. I, I use that for some editing, but it's not enabled. It's really going directly to this uh, verification first. So another rule of thumb when you're working with ver when you're working with this modular kind of approach, you typically want to start your subtest with a verification. Are we in the right spot before we try to continue, right? That way you can string these modules together and you can get a very nice test out of it. Now this particular test actually has a subtest in a subtest. And this subtest is in a subtest because it's data driven and it loops. Another rule of thumb any test to step that has its own data will naturally create a loop. So this actually has some local data associated with it uh, for different item names. And based off of that, it's actually data driving the element find logic for this edit link. And if we take a quick look at that, uh, and this is a beautiful thing about being able to data drive, is that you can uh, do this data driven functionality at a test level, I'm sorry, at a verification step if you wanted to data drive a verification or a text entry if you want to data drive an input um, or in my case what I'm doing is actually data driving uh, locating a particular row in the grid by inserting that item name so this is actually where you choose your column name for uh, your data and associate it to in this case the inner text contains statement that's here so that it knows which row to find to click the edit button uh, and this is a beautiful uh, chain find expression, parent level grid to row to cell within the grid. That's uh, very powerful, sophisticated. It's not relying on a path. And it actually opens up a lot more testing capabilities that aren't allowed by other tools and frameworks. So that's kind of what's going on in that update subtest. Last but not least, we go into our delete subtest. This actually contains a conditional logic component from our conditional logic library here in the step builder, uh, which is called the wow loop. Basically it can look for something, in this case it's looking for a specific item in the grid and going page by page through the grid until it finds that item. So this is a, a really powerful functionality. Of course, if else is another option where you can really segment things and, and have a kind of a choose your own adventure style test out of it. Um, and last but not least, we'll go back over here to our master and let's go ahead and recreate the Kendo create subtest here. So to show you what that would look like, uh, if I just start up a new, oops, let me get in the right folder, a new test. OK, 
Okay. And once that gets loaded here, we'll open that up and we'll start a new test from scratch and we're gonna use our technique to do that. Now, um, again, as I mentioned, you might have to build a couple tests and to understand the uh, to understand the settings that you might need. So definitely as you're going through your first few tests creation, um, you wanna look for that. You wanna see if, you know, what behaviors you're running into, what uh, find logic, issues might be arising and you know keep in mind that those first few tests they're typically the hardest because you're also analyzing the application and determining what settings to set after that you should be very comfortable uh, with those settings and understand like as you jump into a particular application in this case I'm going into this inline editing grid you know I might come in and make some changes to these settings prior to hitting record right so that's the key is it's flexible it's adjustable and you want to come in and, and use it and make changes to it uh, when you need to in order to fit the application under test. Uh, so I might look at the fine logic strategy here, uh, make sure that things are where I want them to be for this particular application. It looks like we're de-emphasizing ID. We're leaning heavier on, on name and content-based uh, logic here in this particular model. Okay, so that looks like it's good to go. I also have currently my... Uh, uh, simulate real clicks and real typing on by default. So I'll, I'll go with that for now and see if there's any adjustments we need to make for that. So my settings are set. We'll go ahead and hit record here. And let's jump into our Kendo editing grid. And actually right now, another rule of thumb I'm about to break was that I actually have a recorder open. You do want to make sure you close your recorders. You don't really want multiple recording windows open. It's best to have one that's focused. Obviously, if you're working with pop-ups and things, it will have a duplicate uh, window for the pop-up window. But rule of thumb, you definitely want to keep your uh, windows clean. Make sure you don't have a bunch of, of recorders hanging around, right? All right, so one moment here. Let me grab this URL. Okay. So coming over, we're going to drop in our URL. I'm going to target uh, Firefox for this particular example. And here you can see the three recording browsers that you have soon to be uh, added to the Chromium Edge as well with today's release. I have not yet gotten to today's release. Okay, and we're ready to record. Oops, let me make sure I hit the right button. There we go. So it starts up my recorder takes me to that page, adds the navigate step. Again, this is something that you might be best served if you're using a dual monitor setup, right? Have this recording browser on one screen, have test studio environment on the other screen. You're working back and forth between those two screens typically. Um, for demo, demonstration purposes, I'm jamming everything kind of on top of itself here, but uh, this gives you at least uh, the visibility into it. But normally I'd have this on two different screens, right? So as I'm going through this now with this technique in mind, uh, first, I want to create, right? This is our create step. So I'm going to come in and actually add a new record. Now, already, I might be thinking, well, how long did that take to load? Is there is there something I might have to wait for there? I might actually turn on my element highlighter and just go do a quick verification. Let's make sure the add new record button shows up and that it's uh, enabled, for example. So I can go into quick steps for that particular button as you float over with the element highlighter turned on. I can see verify text contains add new record. And now I've already made my test stronger. I've also added a timing element because a verification gives you that extra 15 seconds by default to wait for an element. And that's coming from the test level setting here. Uh, you'll also see the same setting on test list and keep that in mind that the settings you change here for wait on elements and client ready, there's a separate set of those for your test list settings. So once you move tests into test list, Make sure you go through those test list settings and match up your timeouts and things that you might need for that. Okay, so we've added that capability of verifying the element. We can also right click and use our run selected step right here. So you can instantly record and execute things on the fly. You're testing your test as you're building it basically. And you can see it comes back and says, yes, we can do that. Um, 
So I'm not going to rerun every test step all the time, but the point of this is you want to be able to smoothly jump in and out of the element highlighter, add verifications, then get back into actions. And you can easily toggle that on with your print screen button as well. Uh, so we'll go ahead now and click the add new record. And we'll type in our clam chowder there. We'll set a unit price. We'll add some items in stock here. And last but not least, we'll click update. And then again, I'm done with an operation. So I'm going to jump into my element highlighter and use this to then verify the clam chowder is actually showing up in the grid. So at the Kendo, as you can see, the translator kicking in, recognizing this is a Kendo grid. And we can go in and just add the verify text contains clam chowder. So there we have a test with a couple of verifications, one at the beginning to make sure we're in the right spot, one at the end to make sure we finished what we set out to do. Um, if I have problems with this test, which I may, I may add more verifications in between. So if I'm having problems maybe around the combo box toggle or something like that, I may use more verifications to tease out that failure or to eliminate that failure in many cases. So let's go ahead and run this back. Since I'm still in live record mode, I'm going to use the top step and run from here. This prevents me to, uh, from having to open up a new browser or start from scratch. I can simply keep using the one that we have open. And since I use the navigate step, it re-navigates for us. And oh, here we see it clicked on the wrong thing. So this is a good example for us. This will actually yield a false positive and eventually a failure as well. So here in a moment, we should see that failure. It's also going to give me an opportunity to show you a new feature. And here, you actually, you could see it going through image search right there. If you saw the scrolling, that's the automatic image backup with the scrolling function, function enabled where it was looking for that element. So let's look at our failure. And be sure to double click your red X when you have a test failure. This way, you can see the full failure details. This is the complete test log. We can see the browser and version we're running against. The steps to reproduce the issue are here. Some of that failure detail as well. And as you can see, it was unable to locate the element by this uh, fine logic combination. And then it kicked into the element search. Actually couldn't find it by the element search either. Uh, and so it failed out the test. All right, and that's what that element backup does for you is if it could have, it would have continued the test and provided me with a warning. Okay, you also have, of course, your expected results and your failed results, or your at the time of failure screenshot. You have the DOM at the point of failure too. So all of this stuff is in here for you. Your resolve failure, if it's uh, something you can fix right there on the spot, you can do that as well. So don't forget to double click the red X for your failure details. Now, the feature that we added that I wanna mention is the fact that we actually now have with the simulating real clicks and real typing, there is a focus function that scrolls the element to the top of the screen. There's a lot of pages that now have banners and sometimes those elements can slide underneath the banner. So what we've added is the ability to, instead of scroll to element top, you can actually change that to element bottom. So I'm at the test step level for that add new record. And I've just told it, instead of taking it to the top where it slid it under a banner, take it to the bottom. And we're still here, so I'm going to right-click run from here again and start this test from the top. Perfect. And as you can see, we're still in this live record mode, so you can carry on with you know, creating the test, editing the test, uh, jumping back and forth between tests, and I know we're short on time, so I'm gonna come back to my, my new CRUD master test here. And we'll go ahead and run this whole thing in sequence for you as well. So this will show you the full effect of the create, the update, and the delete operation. Uh, and we'll still pick on uh, Firefox here. Now, uh, following this, we'll, we'll have our last poll question, and then we're going to open it up for some Q&A as well, uh, where Ilion can jump in and, and help uh, answer some of those questions in the last few minutes. But as you can see here, it's already gone through the 
the uh, create. Now we're going through the update. This is the loop, the data-driven loop. It's actually data driving how to locate the edit button for the appropriate row, updating three of those. And now it's using the while loop, looking for IPO coffee. It made it to page three and it's there in page three. So hopefully here in a moment, it will go delete IPO coffee. And then it will go back and delete our clam chowder that we had as well on page one. And we're done. So that's a beautiful example of taking advantage of a lot of functionalities in Test Studio. Things like using the element highlighter, adding verifications, keeping your test clean, you know, and, uh, and, and bearing in mind that the settings are important and that they do play a big role as well. So uh, again, we'll have one more poll question uh, starting now and go ahead and hit the buttons on those. And we'll also open it up for your questions. Lots of great questions that are coming in and I'll open it up for, uh, for Ilion here to jump in and help us answer some of those. Ilion, are you there? Yep. <laughs> Thanks, Andy, for the great demo and uh, the good tips and tricks about test automation and test automation with Test Studio. We have a lot of inter interesting questions, but we don't have much time, so I will quickly answer a couple of them. A um, couple of people asked, uh, can can we see uh, inside the, the executive dashboard, can we see local test list results or test list results from some other, uh, other than our own scheduling uh, systems that are run somewhere else? Yes, you can. Uh, in general, all, all scheduled test lists results will be displayed in the executive dashboard, but if you have some that are not run through the scheduling, uh, there is a button inside Test Studio to upload those uh, test, test list results to our server, so they can be displayed in the executive dashboard. So yes, you can you can see also, you can upload also locally run test lists uh, and test list results uh, in the executive dashboard. Uh, another question is, um, how for for the is for the test lists in Visual Studio? How can you execute those test lists? You can either run them inside Visual Studio if you wish from the Test Explorer Visual Studio Test Explorer, uh, but you can also use those test lists in any, any continuous integration or continuous delivery system in Azure DevOps, Jenkins, or whatever you use. We also have command line runner, so if you use anything else. Uh, you can we have seamless integration with some of those tools, but if you have anything more, if you use anything more custom made, you can always uh, use our command line runner and you run those test lists in CI or CD uh, environment. So Andy, I think we are at the top of the hour, so let's wrap it up and we can answer some more questions in the uh, following uh, blog post and article. Great, thank you, Ilion. So that's it for our demonstration and our, our webinar today. Hopefully you guys are excited, as excited as we are to see some of these new features uh, that are coming out. Uh, the ability to really show, hopefully your executive teams, your stakeholders involved, what the health of your application looks like with that dashboard. Um, and uh, we're really interested to hear from you about that and talk to you about that as well. We're happy to schedule calls with you uh, if you want to see these new features more demonstrated, maybe working against your application, or also if you're in the in the case of uh, determining what you might need to do next as far as growing your uh, your implementation of Test Studio, or if you're worried that you're not getting the most out of it, any of those are good reasons to reach out to us, uh, set up a call with us, and of course we're also here with support too. So feel free to reach out to support with any questions you may have, or sales as well and we will happily get you to the appropriate people to, uh, to help you with that. So I want to thank everybody again for attending, and we look forward to seeing you on the next one. Enjoy and happy testing.